Howdy, everybody. We're back. Welcome to another episode of the Cowboys of the Osage podcast, brought to you by the Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum, located in historic downtown Pahuska, Oklahoma. It's old Cody as usual, and I have my co-host as always, Mr. Rodeo Historian himself, Jimbo Snively. Hey, Jimbo, good to see you, and who do we have today? Hey, Cody Boy, it's another great day in the Osage, man, and we got a real good guest lined up today. We got William Humpty Wayne, and uh, he's up and everybody knows him as an up and coming cab roper, but uh, he's also, I guess you'd have to call a cowboy reality show star because here a few weeks ago they had the Guts and Glory uh, reality show on INSP, aka the Gunsmoke Channel. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, they started with 12 competitors and uh, different events. JB Mooney was the host, and they'd eliminate somebody each week, maybe two people. Uh, based on their competition during that week in their events. And uh, it was cab ropers, barrel racing, bronc riders, I think. And uh, to make a long story short, when the smoke cleared at the end of the day, Humpty was the last man standing. All right. And and along with that, he got an automatic qualification to the American Rodeo and $25,000 check, which was was pretty nice. Ain't nothing to sneeze at, Jimbo. So we got a lot to get into, and we really appreciate him coming up here. And Humpty, welcome to the Cowboys of the Old Sage podcast. Thank you all for having me. I'm excited. (laughs) Yeah, we're excited to have you here. Thanks for coming up, Humpty. So uh, you grew up in, where'd you grow up at? Man, I grew up, you know, there in North Tulsa. uh, I mean, 28th Street, like I said, and I mean, it's pretty rough. I mean, I didn't have a calf open arena in my backyard growing up but i mean it was you know kind of the streets of tulsa and i mean it was pretty rough that's for sure you, your dad was uh, he, he was interested in horses and rodeo Is yeah right? my dad roped calves growing up my grandpa had a uh, bulldog and horses and bulldog and just wasn't for me and my dad but my dad roped calves uh, his whole life huh. growing up well he started when he was about 14 but he was around horses most of his life yeah, I ended my bulldogging career a little early, too. I just chihuahua now. That's all I do, Jimbo. Right, yeah. I never did start my bull riding or bulldogging career. <laughs> it don't make one. any sense, really. No, no. It don't make any sense. I'll rope them, but I'm going to get on one. Yeah, yes, I'd, I'd, I'd rather rope them personally. Yeah. I'd rather rope them personally. Yes, yes. <laughs> For sure. So who taught you to rope over there? Uh, my dad. You know, uh, ever since I was four years old, he put a rope in my hand and you know, when he put that rope in my hand, I, I, I seen great things, but I just hadn't had a chance to accomplish, you know, the things. But my dad, he was, you know, he's been my main teacher my whole life. He's, you know, he's put me on multiple horses. He's he's done everything that, you know, a dad should do to get me to rope. And so, you know, I got to give all the credit to him. Did you do the youth rodeo thing? Yes, sir. I went to like the NYRAs and the OJRA rodeos, you know, coming up, you know, junior rodeo. But you know, when I turned about 14 years old, those rodeos just didn't pay very mm. much. So when I turned 14, my dad said, you know, it's time to, you know, rope with the big boys or we're on figuring out something else. And so, you know, he took me to the big calf ropings and the, you know, open rodeos when I was 14 years old. Wow. How did you go about getting to qualified to be on the TV show? <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, I was just scrolling Facebook and, you know, one of my friends had sent it to me and he said, man, I, I think you should sign up for that TV or this TV show. I think it could you know, really change your life. And, you know, for me, I was like, oh, I'm not much of a TV guy. I'm really not, you know, used to, you know, being on TV. I've never been on TV. I don't know how to accept <laughs> being on TV. So, you know, he sent it to me and I just I kind of blowed it off there for a day. I said, man, I just don't know. And, you know, it's kind of crazy how it happened. You know, God just kept putting it on my mind, just kept making me remember, you know, something about it. And so, you know, the next day it scrolled across Facebook again. And I was like, man, you know, maybe I should sign up for this show. I mean, you know, what's it going to hurt? You know, so, you know, I kind of filled out the application and and it was just one thing after another that, you know, just fell in the place for me to go to the TV show. There was no... Nothing in the way. Everything just kind of one, two, threes, you know. And so I was like, you know, maybe it is for me to try this out, I guess. It meant to be. Maybe. Yes, yes, sir. That's for sure. Did you have to send in a, like a video of yourself talking or anything to him? 
I had to send like a little two minute video, but what'd you say? Well, I didn't get to send it because my phone like <laughs> screwed up or my video wouldn't go through. Yeah. And so the only thing I could send them was camera open videos. So <laughs> I've got plenty of those. That's cool. Going back just a minute, uh, you were a pretty good football player in high school, what yeah. I understand. Yes, sir. I, I played football there in high school and I was just a. I don't know how to really describe it, man. I was just, I mean, I guess I could describe it as a savage, I guess. I loved it, and I loved everything about it. And so, you know, I put my heart and soul. We won two state championships there in Tulsa. And Who'd you, you know, play for? Uh, Booker T. Booker T. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, and you had a chance to go on and, and play it later on if you'd have wanted to, didn't you? And you just kind of. Yeah, I had some scholarships rolling in there, you know, coming into college or in my senior year there. And it just. I don't know. I'm not going to say it wasn't meant for me, but I just always had something else on my mind. You know, anytime I did play football, I always left to go rope on Saturdays or, you know, Friday nights. If I could make it somewhere to the slack, I, I mean, I might be sore, but, you know, I'd be like, man, you think we can make it somewhere, Dad? Yeah. And he's like, no, man, you'll be fine. We'll just we'll go tomorrow. And so roping just always, I don't know, just it was always what I wanted to do. It was in your blood. You liked football. The roping was in your blood. Yes, sir. That's like. for sure. Yeah. You think playing football helped you get down the rope and be more aggressive, getting a hold of them calves? Or? Man, playing football, you know, it made me <laughs> – like I, I just go back to it. It made me a savage because, like, I learned to be gritty. I learned to be tough. I learned to win. I learned to lose. And so, yeah, it helped me get down the rope for sure because when you got – I mean, I had a guy I had to go against every day. He was 6'4", weighed 300 pounds. I had to figure out how to get away from him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, after high school, though, you, you went, uh, played, or did some college rodeo? Yes, sir. When I left, uh, when I graduated high school, you know, there was a coach down at Connor State named Jake Lawson, and he believed in me. He gave me a scholarship, and, he, and I mean, my family trusted him. I trusted him, and... That was probably the best decision I ever made. You know, I, everybody knew that I was fast and could tie fast calves, but, you know, my horsemanship wasn't the best when I left to go to college. And so when I got to college, you know, Jake, he didn't focus on, you know, making me be a faster calf roper or making me do things that I didn't know already how to do. He made me become a horseman. He made me learn how to, you know, fix my horses. And basically he helped me win, you know, using my horse and not just my natural ability and so i was pretty thankful for that and then you had an association with stockton graves too right yes sir when i graduated from connor state you know stockton graves took me under his wing and you know my like i said my dad he taught me how to rope he taught me everything about roping well then jake taught me how to be a horseman and the stockton graves taught me how to be a winner and you know i owe him everything because you know without going out there and meeting stockton and learning how to win and you know basically learning how to be a little more grittier. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Stockton blessed me, and that's for sure. Northwestern was good to me. Connors was good to, to me. So college rodeo and all was pretty good to me. Hey, Jimbo, everybody talks about Stockton Graves, and uh -huh. he's a great, great steer wrestler. Right. But everybody don't know, he's a pretty darn good calf roper, too. That guy can rope really, really good. Yeah. I found that out when I was out there at college. He does <laughs> rope really well. Yeah, he could always rope calves. Growing up, he would always enter the bulldog and the calf rope and team rope and everything until he started specializing in the bulldogging, you know. So yeah. right. that guy was always a threat every event. I'm surprised he's not at the timed event every year, honestly. Yeah. He'd be a good one uh -huh. to pick for the timed event. So if you're listening out there, Stockton, why don't you start getting ready for that timed event over there? <laughs> uh, what made you want to be a cab over beside your dad? I mean, you know, just uh, just growing up around it. Well, I, you know, like I said, when did I did you have any heroes? What I'm trying to say, you know, besides your dad, who'd you look up to? You know, when I was eight years old, my dad took me to Mike Johnson's World's Richest Calf Roping, and you know, we're standing down the bottom and. All the calf ropers are coming out. It's out there, I mean, getting ready for the short round, and they're checking their calves, and Fred Whitfield walks out. And, I mean, this guy's huge. I mean, I'm eight years old, and I look up, and, you know, it's just like, man, wow, look at this guy, you know. And I walk up to him, and, you know, he – I don't know if it was just, you know, me being a kid or me wanting to be a calf roper, but, you know, seeing him, you know, go 7'5 and 7'8 that day, 
and come out, I mean, right after it's over and come out and shake my hand and he gave me two picking strings and it just, you know, put that desire in my heart to want to rope calves. And so Fred Whitfield probably is my biggest hero, you know, when it comes to roping calves. That's a pretty good hero to have. Holy moly, he's a... Just, not just his rope ability, but just the way he carried himself. You know, he was just a, a class... And I don't know him, but just watching him on TV and stuff, he just looks like a class act to me. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, he was dang sure good to me that day. He gave me two picking strings, and, you know, I, was, I still have those picking strings 21 years later. Still got them, and, you know, that's probably the coolest coolest gift I've ever been given, you know, yeah. from, from an outsider. Huh. Well, getting, I, go ahead. One thing about Fred, all these uh, up-and-coming calf ropers, I've seen them try it out there at the Thomas and Mac, but he's the only guy that could raise the roof like that right. and get everybody going, man. It was just right. uh, so good to watch Fred. Yeah, they and, call uh, that the, the house that Joe built, but I think Fred helped, had a hand in building it. He had a too. hand in it for sure. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, I used to watch some matches growing up. Fred Whitfield, Joe Beaver, uh -huh. Fred Whitfield, Cody Old down there at – the San Angelo uh -huh. Roping Fiesta. Uh -huh. And I tell you what, those were some really, really, some of the best matches in history, Jim. Right, Bob. right. We need to go back and rewatch some of those. Yeah, I'd those. like to get some of those old Dean, uh, Jim Bob Alton and Dean Oliver types too. That'd be good. Oh, watching. yeah. Those would be some good ones. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Fred Whitfield, he was just one of the best to ever come. Yeah. I remember when he came on and uh, no one expected it, you know, just, it was just a, a guy out of the blue, out of nowhere. He just came and won the world. Yeah. And then several of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and some all rounds too. Yep. But, yeah, I saw him rope some tripping some steers before, Jimbo. Really? Yeah, up right. at Cheyenne. Yeah. Everybody's entering Cheyenne. Oh, yeah, they always do. But, uh, well, getting back to Guts and Glory, uh, did you make some friends there? Were y'all just really competitive against each other, or how'd that go? Yeah, I, make, I mean, I made friends with just about everybody there. You know, that's one trait that my parents instilled in me, you know. You know, you gotta. I mean, you gotta be friendly. You can't be rude, and you can't, you know, disrespect, and you can't hate. And you know, when I got there, you know, I didn't know but one person there, and that was King. And we've been friends, you know, growing up our whole lives. You know, me and him, we kind of have similar backgrounds. We kind of come from the same place. And you know, I, you know, Amanda, she was amazing. She, uh, you know, she kind of took me up under her wing and. You know, she told me the things that I, you know, I needed to know and the things that, you know, if I was slacking, she was dang sure there for me. And, you know, me and KK Rule, we talk, you know, just about every other day. She, she's, a, she's a good one. I got to meet her mom, Donna Kay, the other night at Fort Worth. And, you know, that was, that was amazing. I loved it. Uh, Rhett Fanning and Tyrell Larson and Brody, they were the Bronc Riders there. And, you know, I've become friends with all those guys. And, you know, that TV show was you know, it was dang sure fun, and I mean, probably, you know, one of my favorites to meet there was probably JB, you know, that mm -hmm. guy. I watch him on TV, and, you know, to think that I had the chance to sit there and him believe in me and him send me to the Americans, you know, that was unbelievable. And Tammy, she was the barrel racing coach. She was, I mean, she was phenomenal. She you know, she took me up under her wing. If I was slack in some way, she dang sure, you know, pinched me on the ear like, hey, you need to fix that. We well, need to get this right. You know, Tammy, she was great. Every, all in all, everybody there was pretty good. And I'm friends with just about everybody there still. You know, it was dang sure fun. Sounds like you were telling us about the COVID was going strong then and some of the protocols they had to take had to be tested Pretty, pretty often. I had to be tested uh, three or four times before I left, and then one time when I got there, and another time when I got sick there, I got freaking tested for COVID all oh, five, six, uh, probably seven times yeah. throughout the whole process. Wow. How many people were on the production crew working on that around you? <sighs> Holy smoke. Because when, when the movie came here, there was, a, you know, over a thousand people here uh, every day there, there to film it. There was hundreds. I've I seen... I mean, hundreds of different people within a two-week course. I mean, mm. they were and they were all great. They were all nice. I mean, nobody really rude. They were all accepting of us being there. I mean, it was it was a lot of people. How long did it take to shoot that, those five episodes? Uh, fourteen days. Fourteen days. Yes, sir. Where'd they put you up at? We were in uh, Mineral Wells, Texas. We roped at Stephenville and Weatherford. Yeah, we were up at Weatherford, the Sheriff's Posse Arena outdoor, and then Stephenville. Uh, that's Bucky Harmon's indoor. Pretty nice place, actually. Both of them were. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, 
And uh, what was it like when JB said, uh, I want you, you're the winner, you're going to Fort Worth? You know, it was kind of unbelievable, you know, because every little kid, you know, roping their dummy as a kid, like, I mean, as me, I, I wrote my dummy hundreds of thousands of times when I was a kid, and I always, you know, wanted a chance to rope for big money. I always wanted a chance to, you know, get my family, you know, out of the situation that we were living in. And so when he, you know, called my name to, to say I won that TV show, you know, I just kind of looked up and thank God, you know, for the opportunity that I was just blessed with because, you know, I've never won big rodeo titles. I've never won the high school finals. I never won, you know, big rodeos. And so, you know, to win that and be the first ever to win that and then now have a chance to go rope in the American, it was just, you know, it was life changing for me my family, you know, my wife, my little girl. So, you know, it was just kind of, I just had to stop and, you know, you know, thank God for the opportunity, to be honest with you. Right. What was the format exactly? How did you keep, did they eliminate people every episode? How did you keep going on? And I, did, I just, uh, I'm trying to figure it out with all these different <laughs> events. You're not, did you have to barrel race? I didn't get to watch it. I'm going to have to go back and watch it all. So we started with four barrel racers, four calf ropers, and four saddle bronc riders. And we had practices uh, every other day. And there was, uh, at the practices, there was, you know, there was a competition at the end of every practice. And it was really just, you know, they watch us run four or five calves and we had to go as fast as we could on the last one. And, you know, I always want to go fast. It doesn't matter whether I'm practicing or whether I'm in the competition. And that's the same thing, you know, for the saddle bronc riders and the barrel racers. You know, and Diamond G brought some bucking horses in that really made those guys ride horses. It wasn't just, you know, a layup for them guys. I didn't have to get on a bucking horse, I'm glad. <laughs> and I didn't have to run any barrels. I mean, I'd, I'd be more thankful for that. But, you know, the... the <laughs> Why did they put you on a buck and barrel horse? That would have been wild. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. I don't ride the buckers very well. No. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we had to compete every day, whether we were at the competitions or whether we were at practice. And, I mean, there were some times, there were some lows for me there. I broke some barriers that, you know, kind of got me at the bottom of the pack. But when I first got there, I, I said to myself, if I can win this first competition, you know, dominate the practices and get ahead early. That was my game plan. And that's what I did. I won the first, you know, competition there. And I just kept tying calves faster and faster and faster. And so then, you know, I, you, know you kind of feel unstoppable, but you still got to remain humble because, you know, them, them guys, they didn't get picked to be there just because they were, you know, slouches. They got picked to be there because they roped good. Well, I broke a barrier and kind of got down. And I was fighting my head because at the same time, of being there, I had made the IFR. And so I kind of had to pick of either being there, you know, with the TV show or being at the IFR. Not very many people knew my situation. And so, you know, I'm going back and forth of how I can change my, you know, change my family's life. You know, is it, you know, being here at the IFR or is it being at the TV show? Well, I mean, in all reality, if I had the chance to choose myself, you know, going back, you know, to just me and myself, I probably would have stayed at the IFR because I worked all year to get there. You know, I traveled hundreds of miles. I spent a lot of diesel money, run a lot of calves, had a lot of heartbreak, but I lost a good horse out there, you know, trying to make the IFR. But once I got to the TV show, it was just like, you're meant to be here. You need to be here. And this can change your life forever. And so staying there, you know, I changed my life, you know, I didn't win the American. I didn't have a good run at the American, but you know, I've met some great people. I've you know, done things that I'd never ever thought I'd get to do. I got to go places that I'd never got to think I'd, I mean, I'd get to go. And so now, you know, it's just been a blessing throughout this whole, you know, this whole opportunity. What was it like when you went to the mayor? You roped in the old Coliseum Friday night, right? Yes, sir. You know, it was every kid's dream, you know. You know, every kid's dream is to make the NFR. And I have not made the NFR, have not been close, but, you know, for me, that's probably the closest I'm going to get to making the NFR for me. You know, I was backed in there with the best 10 guys in the world. And, you know, that's an opportunity that, you know, most kids or most people, you know, they're not going to get to say that they backed in the box and competed against the best 10 in the world in one setting. Right. And, and so that was big for me. That's a historic 
old arena there, you know, my grandpa roped in that place in the 30s, that old uh, Fort Worth Coliseum. You know, I was reading something a while back, Jimbo, I think, now don't hold me to this, I think it might be one of the first indoor arenas it's built sure specifically for an indoor arena in the United States. Yeah, I've got an old newspaper article of my grandpa setting an arena record there in 1938 i think it was 14 something and the next night jake mcclure broke it you know but <laughs> that's just the difference Back it's a little bitty old arena yeah yeah but a lot of history there for yes, sure sir. well then you went to the american then i'm sure on sunday didn't you just to watch yes i did you know uh glassman media and teton ridge they gave me and my family probably the greatest seats in the house right you know i was right there on the floor right i mean right next to the dirt i could probably touch the bucket horses and t- yeah. i mean i could touch everything it was in arm's reach i mean it was it was amazing they were great to me i mean like um, i said it was an opportunity that most people won't ever get the chance to what was that atmosphere like now that place was packed wasn't it you know it was probably the greatest feeling in the world because it brought back you know, a lot of memories for me as far as playing football and roping. You know, I was in Dallas Cowboy Stadium watching a rodeo. That's, you know, that's two of my loves brought in one place. So it was probably the greatest feeling in the world. Well, that was, I don't know what that place holds, but it looked full to me. I heard that uh, they told me that there was 40,000 plus yeah. in there. Wow. That's a big rodeo. Yeah. Can you imagine? Roping, I think there was $3.2 million in prize money up between that bonus and then all the average payouts. $3.2 million up for grabs in front of 40,000 people on national TV. I mean, uh, who these old ropers are long gone. What would they have thought of that? Would they even believe it? It, it does seem pretty surreal to see where the sport of rodeo is headed to now, for sure, Jimbo. What about Teton Ridge? Do you know anything about them, Cody? No, it seems like they're making a, a huge investment in the in our sport in the Western way of life, and um, that's all about all I know about them. I see their name everywhere, Jimbo. Yeah, I know it. I mean, it's got to be good. I mean, uh, somebody with that much money and trying to improve the uh, Western way of life and uh, rodeo in particular, and I can't see where it could be anything but good for rodeo. Yes, sir. You know, I got to meet Thomas Toll when I was there, Did you? and you know. He's a self-made billionaire. He, he owns the Pittsburgh Steelers, is that yes, right? Yes, sir. He owns the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he owns the American. Right. And he's a self-made billionaire. That guy, you know, when I got to talk to him there, it was kind of like talking to a friend. You know what uh-huh. I mean? It wasn't like talking to a billionaire. He shook my hand, you know, as Humpty. He introduced himself as Thomas. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, you know, talking to somebody that, you know, did I know he had all this money? No, I didn't. You know what I mean? Right. It was just like... You know, as a friend, he and he, he, you know, he said to me, he said, you know, you know, when they were filming this show, everybody told me that I need to meet this guy, Humpty. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was like, I, I need to meet this guy. And I'm like to myself, I'm like, well, man, I need to meet you. You know, you're the guy that changed my life. Right. You know, I need to, I need to meet you. <laughs> and, you know, Teton Ridge, you know, they've been great. That ranch over there is, oh, man, it's phenomenal. I mean, it was probably one of the nicest places I've ever been. I think he might be affiliated with Taylor Sheridan, too, a little bit. No kidding. Yeah. Well, they, uh, I tell you what, they're doing a jam up job with that American rodeo. I know it. it, can't, it you know, Patrick Koch did a uh, really good job with it, but I think he's just going to take it to the, to the next level if that's possible. Well, you know, it's always good to see different people from different um, proven sporting genres get in this western way of life and start back in rodeo like they do football or Mm -hmm. stuff like that especially billionaires that you know from i don't even know where he's from just getting involved with rodeo i'm anyone with a billion dollars wants to get involved with rodeo and make it better to me seems like a pretty good idea jimbo right right i I can't see where it could do anything but help you know what was it like walking around downtown fort worth and at&t stadium with all your newfound celebrity humpty Oh, man. So, How many people stopped you? How many kids wanted you to sign their hat? How many? It was you know, it was amazing. You know, when I first got into Fort Worth, they got me at this big old hotel. <laughs> and when I pull in, you know, I got freaking sweatpants on and a yeah. hoodie, you know. And my, my little girl's got pajamas on because we left at 6 a.m. And so when we roll in there, we're at this big, fancy, nice hotel. And I step out, and, you know, these guys are like, 
hey, let me get your bags. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, can, I can get it, you know. And yeah. so, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was amazing. It was fun. You know, I've never had anything like that happen in my life. Uh, we would go up to our room, and I've got to check in at Fort Worth at 4. And when I come back down, the whole Teton Ridge – Everybody from Teton Ridge was standing downstairs and probably gave me one of the biggest welcomes and, you know, high fives and, you know, just made you feel appreciated, you know, and I can't thank them enough, you know, just for, like I said, just for the opportunity because, I mean, it, it came out of nowhere, really. <laughs> Did anybody uh, offer you to sign their baby when they were so excited to see you? No, I didn't get to sign any babies. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Well, one of these days you might get a baby. What about when you got back home, Hump? They, uh, I was at the horse sale the other night, and they stopped the entire horse sale, Jimbo, to talk about this guy. Everybody in the whole, it was a packed place. Everyone clapped for him. And, really? Yeah, I think it was right before he went to the American. We were all wishing him luck. Yeah, what about what about around here? Have you seen a lot of people that's recognized you? You're getting a lot of calls from all your old friends, and so yeah, you know Thursday night, you know Kyle Myers, he's the he's the auctioneer there, and you know he's been a great friend of mine. You know, like I said, there's been people that's helped me, th you know, throughout my whole journey at calf rope, and and you know he he invites me to his house, invites me to rope, never asked me for anything. You know, he's believed in me. Without even, I mean, he's believed in me for, with nothing. And I got to thank him for that. But, you know, when I got back home, News Channel 2 and News Channel 8 had aired that, you know, I was going to rope for $2.1 million. And, you know, to have that opportunity is amazing. When, like I told him before I left, win, lose, or draw, this opportunity was going to change my life. And, you know, when I got back home, you know, all my friends, you know, they contacted me. Just let me know, you know, it's, you know, this ain't the end for you. It's just, this is just the beginning. And I'm thinking, heck, I've been roping calves my whole life, and this is just the beginning. <laughs> but, you know, they say, you know, this is just the beginning. You know, you know, big things are about to happen, and, you know, just, you know, accept it and embrace it. And so when I got back home, like I said, all my friends, you know, they went to messaging me and calling me, and, man, we're proud of you. No matter what happened, no matter the situation there, you know, we're so proud of you. We're so proud of the stage that you got to rope on. We're so proud of, you know, there's a lot of little kids that come to the ropings and the jackpots that I have and, you know, just don't have the opportunity. And so I was glad to show all the kids, you know, back home where I'm from that, you know, opportunities, opportunities are endless. You can do just about whatever you want. And I just showed that. I just showed that you can rope on the biggest stage in the world coming from nothing. You know, I, 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 I mean, I don't have the big fancy rigs. I don't have the big high dollar horses. You know, I don't have an endless bank account. You know, I, I work and I ride horses every single day. And when I came home from the American, you know, the first thing I did when I got home, I saddled one of my colts and I went to ride. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Do you rope on your own horse? I mean, was that your own horse you're using down at Fort Worth? or No. So I got to, that horse, her name's uh, Sparky's Gold Digger. She was the uh, reserve world champion horse at the AQHA last year. And I got to ride that horse, you know, a lot, jackpotting a few years ago. And, you know, I didn't know it was going to lead to the opportunity to ride her at the American. But, you know, I wanted to, you know, to be the reserve horse of the, I mean, at the AQHA final, she's got to be perfect. And so when I was deciding a horse to ride at the American, I said, you know, I want a horse that's going to give me an opportunity to make the best run possible. And I knew that to win second in the world, she has to be perfect 99% of the time. And Brandon Bowers, he believed in me. That's who owns her. C.R. Bradley, he, he shows her. And so when I called Brandon, I asked, could I ride her? And, you know, I, it was kind of like a... I mean, like a, a hell yes, you know, he just, <laughs> yeah, 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 whatever I can do, you know, yeah, I want you on her, I want you to ride her, I, I want the world to see you and her together, you know, and, you know, he was great about it, CR was great about it, and I was, man, fortunate to get to ride her. Well, you didn't draw the best calf in the world. Man, yeah. that calf kind of fell off there to the left. 
It ran pretty hard. That's it a is. bad shot for a calf roper. It's a good shot for a steer roper. Right. Calf roper. It's really a bad shot there at Fort Worth. Yeah. When they fall off to the left, it's kind of hidden over there. And pickup man kind of sits down there in the corner. But hey, you know, it happens and it's part of calf rope and I'm gonna accept I'm gonna accept it and move on. Oh you yeah. know what oh, I mean? you Yeah. I'm gonna be ready to run the next one, that's for sure. Speaking of horses, what calf roping's evolved over the years, you know, a lot. And um maybe a horse worked too much now he can hurt you, you know. What do you want what what does a horse need to do to let you win today? You know, for me I just need a I mean, I just need one I mean, I don't need him to be perfect. I've never had a perfect horse, and so I just need one to do the basics. You know, score, run, stop, and pull. Mm -hmm. I don't need all the fancy, you know, knickknacks or none of that. I just, I just want an honest one, you know. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's for sure. All I, I mean, that's all I need there. I mean, I think that's all any calf rubber could ever ask for is one run, stop, and pull. You don't need none of the fancy, all that crap. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> you know, one thing you see in calf rope horses today and it's not their fault but with all the short scores and the quick throws you see a lot of horses bad to set up you know if the calf runs yeah and they they don't catch them right quick you know then then the cowboy has a hard time getting a throw you know, there's a, what do you do with a horse like that like in the practice pen you just man like me when i practice i just i don't know i don't ask them to go 100 percent in the practice pen you know I, I run calves that really run i got calves that are really slow and you know, I just mix it up. I'm gonna throw it fast. I'm dang sure gonna run three or four down there. Mm -hmm. You know, after let him know you're not gonna throw it right across yeah, the line. Yeah, let every him time. know on the next four. I need you to keep running. Right. I right. don't need you to stop that fast every single time. And so, you know, that, for me, I have to ride the same horse at every setup. Right. You know, whether it's a fast setup, long, short. I mean, you know, there's people out there fortunate enough to have three or four in their rig and have one for every setup, and that's not <laughs> right. me for sure. <laughs> yeah. <right>. Yeah. <laughs> That ain't me either, Jim. No, no, no. I was lucky to have one. <laughs> I was lucky to even get there in the rigs I was going in. Yeah. Humpty, um, I don't even think of you as a black cowboy. I mean, you're just a cab roper. But I know a lot of kids, black kids, probably look up to you. Do you feel a responsibility to uh, to help them? And, and have you seen a lot of interest in, since you came along there, uh, kids wanting to be like you? Man... What a lot of people don't really understand is, you know, like you said, a cowboy's a cowboy, a calf roper's a calf roper to me. And so, yeah, there's a lot of kids that do look up to me. There's a lot of kids that, you know, have messaged me or added me on Facebook just to, you know, see my story and see, you know, where I've came from and, you know, potentially where I'm going. And, you know, like I said, I, I put on free roping clinics, you know, at Barlowsville. I put them on at my house and you know, I don't look at those kids by color. I don't, you know, that color don't matter to me. If a kid wants to rope calves, I'm going to help them, you know, and if they want to know my story, I'm going to tell it to them whether they're white, black, pink, purple. I don't care, you know, and I'm, you know, if there is a black kid that does want to rope, you know, that does excite me just because, you know, like I said, I, I mean, I want to see. I want to see the next Fred Whitfield. I want to see the next Bud Ford. You know what I mean? There's Sylvester Mayfield. Yeah, you know what I mean? And so, you know, maybe that's not me, but maybe I could help the next one, you know, for sure. And just like I told him on the TV show, you know, a lot of people don't understand it, but, you know, when I show up to the rodeo, I got one job, and that's to back and untie them calves as fast as I can. And if I focus, you know, on everything that's going on in the stands – I beat before I start. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm white, black, you know, it don't matter. And so that's kind of how I look at it. Well, he's going to have to sit there for about a minute, sitting in the box, facing the back of the the uh, box there on his horse, waiting for the announcer to get done talking about him, all his all his great stuff that he has to talk about now, being a major TV star and <laughs> Signing babies everywhere back behind the <laughs> grandstands and stuff like that. He's going to be, I can only hear it now. It's going to be, here's the guy. I don't, I'm not an announcer, you know, but <laughs> if you've ever watched TV, you watch this guy, you know, yeah. it's going to, it's going to live with you forever, Humpty. Man, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be pretty fun. Did you say you put on ropings? Yes, sir. We, you know, I put on a big calf rope in here. Me and my sister-in-law at Pahuska. Oh, probably two or three years ago, and we had Timber Moore and Marty Yates, and I mean, we had some big name guys here, and it was, 
You know, it was a great rope. And, you know, we put on weekly calf ropings there at Oshaleta, you know, me and my dad. And, yeah, one of the first calf ropings I ever entered was over there. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talk about setting up horse. I got on Kelly Casebolt's old calf horse in that <laughs> booger. <laughs> I was talking soprano there for about an hour after that dang uh, run. Sorry about that, huh? No, you're all right. You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember what we were talking about. I don't either. Oshalata. 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 You put on the calf ropings in Oshalata, and oh, I yeah, cut we, you off talking about getting racked. Well, we supply calves, you know, all over, you know, some of the IRA rodeos, ACRA rodeos. That's kind of, you know, what I do, but, you know, outside of riding horses is, you know, supply those calves. And, you know, I mean, I've met a lot of people doing it. It's a very thankless job. It is. And it's a very rewarding job. So when you do supply the calves, I'm going to tell you how it works. Everybody that win a check, they're going to love you, no, right. Jimbo. And then everybody that don't win a check, it's your fault for bringing that calf, and they're all mad at you. Winners okay, love so. them, losers hate them. That's just the way it is. That's the way it's, it's always, always been. been. That way. That's the way it's always been. You win a few, you lose a few. And there's always more losers than there are winners. Right, right. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and you can't place on every single calf. No. Part of it's still got to come down to the luck of the draw. Yeah. Right? Part of it's still got to come down to the luck of the draw. People's got to remember that. Sure. Heck yeah, because it was my choice. I'd have picked one of the 17 others other than the one I run. <laughs> yeah, right. right it yeah. always seemed like when we were taking cattle places, Jimbo, I'd end up with the one that you definitely didn't yeah. want sometime in the well, in the roping. Well, Humpty's right. You know, most of those calves were going running straight and waited on them, and Humpty's calf run over to the left and ran pretty hard, you know. <laughs> it's just, it's just it's, you luck of the draw. Yes, sir. Talk about to the left. He mentioned Marty Yates' name the other day just a minute ago did you see that run that he made at the american on uh -huh. that calf that turned right. to the left that right. was that was a one of the better well so many of these horses runs anymore go to the left that i've seen you know calves. they're kind of lost if a calf goes to the left and the roper ends up roping around the horse's neck you know because the cat the horse didn't get over there like but his horse got over there and and uh give him a throw and he made a heck of a heck of a run on that calf well it's the same on a steer horse if uh if a steer can go right very far, a lot of steer horses kind of lose track of those lose yep. steers because we got left on the brain from the time right. we right. That's true. leave the uh, chute. So so you put on ropings, you supply cattle, you rope, you rodeo, you mentor kids. What else do you got going on? What, 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 do you, what, what kind of plans do you have to uh, maybe use your new celebrity to be part of your living now? Man, I... I don't know. I, I'm going to keep putting on the ropings. And my sister, she owns uh, Overcross Council and Equine Services, and I help her quite a bit. And so I don't know for sure what I'm going to do yet. Maybe I'll have to ask her to help me. No, but I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I hope life doesn't change for me much. You know, I just want to be a rodeo cowboy. And, you know, if it was, you know, if it's for me to do something bigger, I sure sure ready to accept it but i don't know I, I mean i don't really have a plan just yet if anyone's got some good ideas for humpty get a hold of him <laughs> yeah that's for sure <laughs> he's famous now right <laughs> one of our famous okies i like it another one yep for sure you showed you, you did us you did us proud down there in texas i sure hope so you know, that was one thing that i really worried about you know with it, accepting to even go to the tv show was I said that I, you know, I just wanted to make everybody proud. You know, win, lose, or draw. I didn't want to go there and make a fool out of myself, you know, on national television because, you know, I got to live with the res end result, you know, for the rest of my life. And so I just wanted everybody to be, you know, a lot of people say it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks, but ultimately you want people to be proud of the things you accomplish and you want people to, you know, be proud of the things you do in life. And so, it, you know, it's really heartwarming that people, you know, are you know, pretty proud of what I did there. And, I'm, you know, I wish I could have won the American for him, that's for sure. Holy moly. Could you imagine the rodeo? You could you could rodeo nonstop for at least at least a year, <laughs> a year with that $2 million. <laughs> and I, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. rodeo. Well, did you see the price of gas out there, well, Jimbo? <laughs> $5 a gallon. <laughs> it's going to take $2 million to go to rodeos this right. year. Oh, man. Well, Humpty... Jimbo, you got anything else for him? Well, just appreciate him coming up here. Like you said, five dollar gas, and he drives up from Tulsa to visit with us. We really appreciate it, <laughs> and uh, wish you well with your cab open. But with his personality and attitude, he's going to do. You're going to do well in anything you do. 
and uh, we just wish you well and thanks for coming out yes sir i sure appreciate y'all you know thank y'all for the opportunity like i said you know the opportunities are endless and this is pretty a really big opportunity for me and i appreciate y'all for having me well we just appreciate you coming up and we're dang proud of you wish you wouldn't have drew a bad calf the other night but you did that's just the way rodeo goes but there's going to be another one on down the road somewhere. Yes, sir. There is. All good one somewhere else. Yes, sir. Just got to capitalize on the good opportunities. That's, That's right. for sure. Well, I need to send my girls over here to have him mentor them a little bit on uh, on roping. Right. Roping some calves. I like his outlook. I know. I like his attitude, Jimbo. Absolutely. And we're dang proud of him right here in Oklahoma. And thanks for coming, Humpty. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for having me. You're quite welcome. All right, we'll see everybody next week right here on the Cowboys of the Osage podcast. Thank you all very much.